Hi guys and girls, I'm Obsidian Ant, and welcome to 3301. This is where I take a look at the news and happenings in and around Elite Dangerous. Today we're going to take a look at the ongoing Community Gold to get their station inside the Pleiades Star Nebula. We're also going to have a look at the latest information for Horizons and the SRV reveals. This week I released a new series called Commander's Odyssey, I want to tell you a bit about that. And coming up a little later, I've got a giveaway for a paint job and a decals. The Pleiades Nebula Station Community Goal continues. Last week, two new Community Goals were released after the successful completion of the previous Community Goal, which reached Tier 8 and unlocked everything that needed to be unlocked. The two new Community Goals are a Pirate Hunt and a new Mining Goal, where the players need to mine Palladium for the station. The initial Pirate Community Goal was completed within a matter of a few hours. Whether players managed, had thousands of vouchers to hand in, or whether the community goal just bugged out, we don't really know. It was just completed very, very quick. But Frontier were quite responsive on that, and released another community goal for pirate hunting called the Pirate Strike Back within a few hours, or within a few days. And that community goal is now well underway. The first of these goals then, the pirate hunt, is basically to keep the area secure. Players have to go out and hunt pirates. This can extend to player pirates or players with a bounty on their head, as long as it's valid within that particular system. And you then go back and hand these vouchers in to the station Neville Horizons within Cash Poos. And this will unlock tiers within the community goal itself. The more vouchers you hand in, the greater your individual reward will be, and the greater the collective reward will be. The second of these current community goals is mining. Now the station needs to be constructed. We've already collected a load of metals for that, but this particular community goal will determine the level of services the station has. And for that, we need to mine palladium. Now each tier that is unlocked on this particular community goal will increase the services that the station has. The community goal does look like a particularly difficult one, so that may be a little bit of a challenge. It does require palladium to be handed in, as I just mentioned, but it has to be mined. It cannot be purchased. If you purchase it at a commodities market or elsewhere and try and deliver it, it will not count as being contributions towards the community goal, so it does have to be mined. Now, the best chances of mining palladium are to mine within pristine metallic ring systems. These are not too hard to find, although they can be few and far between. I've put a list in the video description of local systems that actually contain these type of belts. So use that list and if you want to mine and go and mine in those areas, they are the best available locations. Now what's next for these particular community goals, we don't know, but the station will need to be moved to Pleiades. So that will probably be a community goal stage at one point, as I suspect it's not likely the station to get all the way out to Pleiades without any form of player intervention. So, all in all, those community goals are progressing along nicely. Last week we had yet another live stream from Frontier, showing us more details and content from Horizons. We also got a sneak peek again from David Braben, showing us a little bit of uh, base attacks, attacking some outposts or settlements on one of the planetary surfaces. On the live stream, we got to see one of the crashed ships up close and personal, and it's pretty nice to see the wrecks look great. And they actually look like wrecks, rather than just placed ships. There was a little bit of concern, at least from me, that some of the sh crashed wrecks might just be ships placed on the ground. So seeing them wrecked and broken apart like that in various stages on the ground was nice to see. Frontier also showed us the SRV being controlled from two different views. We saw it from the cockpit view, where it's also possible to shoot the vehicle's weapons, but they also showed the SRV being controlled from a turret light view. From this turret view, it was also possible to drive the SRV, but it would seem that there are improved controls from the weapons from this viewpoint. Now, I'm actually curious to see how all this is gonna play out with a HOTA setup. My concern is that there might be some difficulty with aiming the weapons. Currently with a HOTUS, or indeed with all the controls, when we're in our ship, we point our ship towards our target, and if we have fixed weapons, we rely upon the fine manoeuvring of the ship to aim. And if we're using gimbaled weapons, then we just need to point our ship in the general direction of our target. Now, with the SRV, and I may be wrong here, but it appeared that the driving of the vehicle and the aiming of the weapons are controlled independently from each other, and this is very different from our ships. 
So driving the vehicle seemed to be controlled from one axis, whilst controlling the turrets seemed to be done from another axis. Now that should be relatively easy with an Xbox pad or similar due to the two analog sticks. Obviously each control input can be bound to a different stick. But with a HOTUS it's going to be a little bit more difficult. In fact, based on what we've seen, I'm not sure how I would control the driving axis independent of the weapons axis. They don't have a whole lot of analog inputs, at least not extra ones that would allow fine control of turrets and weapons independently of fine control of vehicle manoeuvring. But all that said, Frontier have been pretty great with all forms of controller inputs so far, so maybe it would all work out. Now, another thing that was mentioned was station storage. Michael Brooks talked very briefly about station storage and what would be stored at stations. Well, it seems it would be minerals and other materials required for the upcoming crafting system. Very soon now, we will be able to collect loot within the game and apparently some of this will be available in space, but also a whole lot more loot will be available down on the planetary surfaces. There was a bit of talk that enemy skimmers will drop loot of some form and in addition to that, we found out there will be mineral deposits. These can be found on the planet surface itself, and it's very likely that high metal content planets will be great for this. During the Building a Planet livestream that occurred a few weeks ago, Frontier discussed how certain planets have higher values of particular ores or metals. These are the minerals and materials that they are actually constructed from. So it makes sense that certain planet types will have better as well as different types of materials for us. It was also mentioned that we'd be able to find meteors on the ground that would contain materials we'd be able to loot. Now some of the items and resources we can discover on the planets will allow us to modify both our ship and our SRV. And if I'm reading the released information correctly, then at least a part of this gameplay system will be available in the initial Horizons release. Also, more information was revealed on the type of structures we can expect to see on the planets. And these include things like military bases, research establishments, hideouts, starports, mining complexes, crash ships and debris, as well as other things that Frontier aren't talking about just yet. All of these are classed as points of interest and come in various sizes from the starports and settlements to the smaller mineral finds that I mentioned earlier. Points of interest on the planets are split into two categories, natural and man-made. So along with the planetary lanterns themselves, we can start seeing the type of gameplay that is starting to shape up that's going to be occurring down there. And I'll be talking a bit more about that later on in the week. Last week I released the first episode of a new series. I began the series back in April of this year and it is called Commander's Oddity. This is essentially a story arc of episodes where I play in character. So it's a bit different to my other videos and it is very much story driven. The story is broken into two chapters and each chapter contains three episodes. Now, I did release these uh, two of these episodes earlier in the year. I wasn't entirely happy with how they turned out and so I decided to remaster them. They both now have entirely new dialogue which better conveys the story structure. Now, the first chapter will comprise of three episodes with the following titles, A Trader's Town, A Hunter's Dream and A Pilot's War. The first episode I released last week as I mentioned and you can see a short clip of that at the end of this video. Episode 2 should be released this week all going well and I am aiming to release episode 3 either next week or in the following week. Episode 3 will conclude chapter 1 but it will also open the story into chapter 2 which will be released a little later on. So then on to the giveaway. Now this is an EGX giveaway, I have 10 EGX packs to give away. It's still a little bit unclear what these packs are meant to contain. Now Frontier insists that they are paint jobs and decals, and I've personally spoken to Frontier to confirm this. However, no one has yet been able to access the ship paint jobs. Frontier still haven't said why this is or when we can expect to see the paint jobs. However, with previous event packs such as the one from Gamescom weren't put into the game until patch 1.4 which was quite a way after Gamescom itself so maybe the EGX paint jobs will turn up a little bit later. In either event, what we do know is that the EGX pack does contain a decal and this is the EGX X logo as you can see on the screen now and you can apply this to any of your ships. 
Now I have 10 of these packs to give away. During EGX, codes for these were given away from Frontier and various other outlets, and they were generally just sprinkled around at random, meaning that people with the fastest reaction or internet connection got them first. Now, personally, I didn't think that was really the best way of doing it, although it was really the only way of doing it at the time, perhaps. But I'm not going to do that myself, so to make things a bit more fair, I'm going to do a prize draw. To enter the prize draw, simply post in the comments section of this video the phrase, I would like an EGX code, or words to those effects. And I will then choose 10 names at random, and these people would win the codes. I'll do the draw on next week's episode of 3301, and entries to the draw will close on Saturday the 7th of November at midnight, that's UK time GMT. So if you're interested in trying your luck at getting one of these, do put a comment below, and make sure you do that before the closing date. That just about wraps up this episode of 3301, and don't forget to stay about for that clip from Commander's Odyssey, which I'm about to show now. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys and girls next time. A dream of darkness and entropy. It is here where it all began, and it is here where it will end. A journey's end from a simple beginning. I know now that this is where he went when he left. My father never spoke of this place, but I could see it in his eyes. And now I must find him before it's too late. But to do that, I need a ship. And to get a ship, I need money. Sullivan Dock, home to the independence of LFT-133 and they are hopefully going to buy some brilliant from me. I'm Commander Obsidian Ant and I'm out here seeking answers. A year ago my father left without so much as a word. He flew off into the black and no one knew where he went. In the last days before he left, he had madness in his eyes. He spoke constantly of a dream.